Greetings, Broadway babies. I'm Emily. I am Jeff. And welcome to Stealing Focus. So we are here because there is a new TV show that we are very excited about. It's the first time since we did Fosse Burden Vlogs that we really want to review a show episode by episode. Yeah. So that is what we are doing here yeah. uh, with the new musical TV show out on Apple Plus called Schmigadoon. channel is Stealing Focus. If you've never been here before, hi, uh, please subscribe. Uh, we do musical theater reviews, but also musical theater history lessons. Everything has like a little history slant to it. So we hope that you uh, stick around. And so this is the perfect show uh, for us because it is an homage to Golden Age musicals. Yeah. Jeff, do you know anything about Golden Age musicals? Uh, they, they were written a long time ago. That's what they say. <laughs> you've been in a few Golden Age musicals. Yeah, the Rodgers, you've been in quite Rodgers a few. and Hammerstein. Yeah. Yeah. Is, you know, the classic, right? I mean, yeah. If you don't know, I am a uh, budding musical theater historian. I'm going to grad school for musical theater history, and I'm also a performing arts teacher. So um, the golden age of musicals is one of my favorite eras of Broadway history. If you're like me, if you're my age, you grew up with your mom loving it and teaching you all about it. If you're younger, maybe your grandparents like yeah. the golden age of musicals. But um, <laughs> it's a very specific and important era of musical theater. If you ever did a high school musical, You've probably done a Golden Age show. Yeah, my mom would always call us down to watch uh, when uh, Sound of Music was on. And it was like, oh, no. And then all I really remembered was them running from the Nazis at the end. And so the into. Golden Age of musicals uh, basically started in 1943 with the musical Oklahoma, which we have right here. Everything around us right now, these are all Golden Oklahoma. Age musicals. Yes, uh, Oklahoma, written by Rodgers and Hammerstein. Rodgers and Hammerstein were kind of the big names of the Golden Age of musicals. Um, but not the only names, and we're going to talk about some of the other ones. They definitely started the ball rolling in 1943. And then there's kind of like a little bit of a nebulous end date, but um, a lot of us kind of bookend it with Rodgers and Hammerstein's career. They started in 1943 with Oklahoma and they ended in 1959 with The Sound of Music, which happened right before Oscar Hammerstein's death. So uh, he didn't even, he wasn't even alive for the movie version. Wow, um, it was that quick. Yeah, oh. we, I have a, a whole video about the golden age of musicals if you want to check that out. Also, a whole history lesson about Rodgers and Hammerstein, so I'll link that below. Schmigadoon is very much a loving homage to golden age musicals. There are some direct parallels to actual characters, but also kind of representations of like the major tropes of golden mm. age musicals. You know, we look back on it now and it seems very old hat, seems very old fashioned, but at the time it yeah. was extremely revolutionary. Yeah. Um, it really kind of stepped things up a bit because in mm. the, uh, 10s, 20s, and 30s, you know, musicals were very much escapist entertainment with a few exceptions. Yeah. Um, and then when Rodgers and Hammerstein came around, you know, they kind of made it so that you could have kind of fun, big show-stopping numbers, but also um, musicals that would, you know, tell a story and have some darkness yeah, and to them yeah, as well. Yeah, and really deal with uh, issues at the, the heart of the human spirit. I feel like before that, it was musicals were like, we're telling us, we're, we're seeing a play and then there's a tap number. Yeah. And then we're seeing a play and there's another song. That doesn't really move the And story there were forward. blips of kind of seriousness with stuff like um, Showboat in 1927 or, mm. you know, the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, but it really was Oklahoma that kind of started uh, kind of the integrated musical as in um, yeah. songs integrated into the plot. We are here to talk about the first two episodes of Schmigadoon, and we want to break it up kind of into like two sections when we talk about the first two episodes. Um, I'd like to go through it and kind of talk about the references first, because mm. I'm your musical theater history teacher. I want to let you know uh, of all the stuff that they are making fun of directly, lovingly, <laughs> yeah. uh, in their episodes, but then also talk about our opinions and kind of the fun facts of the episodes too. Mm. And uh, you know, this is all the stuff that we were able to catch so if there's anything that we missed, you know, just let me know in the comments and then, you know, maybe we could talk about it in our uh, review of episode three. All right, so let's start with episode one, Schmigadoon! Welcome to our little town Where friends are all you meet Must be something they do for tourists. The first obvious reference, what do you think it is, Jeff? Uh, it's Brigadoon. It's the title, yes. Yeah. I don't know too much about Brigadoon, but I know it's that, that they go over this hill or something and there's mm -hmm. this magical place. Yeah. And... 
Brigadoon came out in 1947, so just a few years after kind of the Golden Age started, and it was written by Lerner and Lowe, who would go on to massive success with their musical My Fair Lady, also in the Golden Age. We'll see if we get any homages to that, none yet. Mm, but, I don't know about that one. They might, <laughs> yeah. they might leave that one out. You never know. Uh, but Brigadoon, uh, it, yeah, it starts with these two guys kind of backpacking through Scotland, and then they happen yeah, yeah. upon a village, yeah. and um, it turns out the village is magic, and it can only show up every 100 years, right. because there's a spell on it, and you can only come back to it again if you like find your true love there. Or something like that. So our main two characters uh, are played by Cecily Strong and Keegan Michael yes. Key, yeah. and they are our uh, kind of backpackers. They're kind of having a hard time in their relationship. They've been yeah. together for a while, yeah. and they end up in this town in Schmigadoon. <laughs> and um, at, so as they um, enter Schmigadoon, we realize that um, the col everything looks like a set. Everything is brightly colored, and all the actors are kind of walking around in that kind of theater way where you're walking like this, so you're open. Yeah. You're on like a quarter turn. Proscenium style, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so downstage. <laughs> so when you get to Schmigadoon, uh, from the opening number, like kind of two main influences become very clear, and those would be Oklahoma and The Music Man. Kind of these small town Americana musicals of the golden age. Yeah, I think what that's a lot, what people think about a lot when they think about musicals. Like yeah. Americana, like some weirdly patriotic with those hats. And it's always kind of the turn of the 20th century-ish. Um, yeah, the good old days. Yeah, it was like nostalgic for like kind of the older people who were, yeah. you know, who were older in the I 40s I wish and things 50s. were like they were back in the past. Could you imagine? Yeah, oh, the other goodness. big thing, at least in the 40s, because of writing musicals like that was because it was post-World War II or in the thick of World War II. Mm. And so Oklahoma was really a big hit um, because uh, the soldiers coming home were seeing this show and it just kind of like mm. reminded them of home yeah. and felt very patriotic and, you know, that kind of thing. But the opening song uh, is very much uh, a mix of both The Music Man and Oklahoma. Um, the title song is very much... It is obviously structured off of Oklahoma. Even yeah. if you ba you know barely know Oklahoma, you're gonna recognize that schmig God do and the spelling it out at the end, you know, that's yeah. all just a direct parody of Oklahoma. But the the character tropes are very much um, the music man. We have a reference to the Wells Fargo wagon right off the bat, which is a title song from The Music Man, um, mm. where all the characters are excited about getting their new things from the Wells Fargo wagon. <laughs> we have a lisping kid. The kid's name is Carson. So you see him, and he keeps popping up and saying, it's here, it's there, it's the mayor, you know? Right. So he's very much Winthrop. And then Ariana DeBose, who we get into kind of more in the second episode, she's very much Marion the Librarian, you know, like a spinster at 28, I think they yeah. say. Okay, so the other big one right off the bat, if you know Golden Age musicals, I, the second I saw him, I was like, this is Billy Bigelow, Aaron Tveit's character, and Billy Bigelow is our kind of anti-hero uh, protagonist from Carousel. And he's got like the hat, he's like kind of barking at like a, at a tunnel of love. Uh, he's, he's got high-waisted pants. <laughs> and um, his, they have this big song together um, called You Can't Tame Me. And what did you think of that one? I dug it, man. I, all the music really struck me right away because clearly they're homages, but they're also the songs in their own right. So in, in the song You Can't Tame Me, um, it's kind of a mix of If I Loved You and Soliloquy from Carousel. It's oh, okay. um, yeah. kind of that conditional love song, which is which was kind of created by Oscar Hammerstein, the idea that these characters just met, how can they have a love song? Yeah, yeah, they so have, they have to. If they I have Loved to. You. And there's some lyrics that are lifted directly. He says, somehow I can see just exactly how it would be, which is hmm. directly from the song If I Loved You. And somehow I can see exactly how it'd be but somehow i can see just exactly how i'd be 
Um, they even have cherry blossoms come down, and like this, the famous scene with them is like taking place on like cherry blossom trees on benches and stuff. But there were also some little shades of like Cole Porter in this, in the sense where he was like listing off the girls or like Irving Berlin, like all the places where he'd been kind of like a bad man. <laughs> um, even kind of Tulsa from the musical Gypsy, that kind of like, oh, I'm gonna totally. do a dance number, aren't I the cool guy? But he was very much like the bad boy, and Cecily Strong is into him, you know, right away. Well, they they have there has to be the love interest for her, and then it has to be love interest for uh, Keegan Michael Key. So they go wandering around the town, and then they they go to the restaurant. And they meet Dove Cameron, who's like kind of a very familiar trope that you see in musicals, like from the Golden Age. The supporting kind of ditzy, sexy baby girl, um, very like Daisy May from Lil Abner. Um, or Ado Annie. I think Ado Annie is a big influence on her. Mm. But um, we get to the song called Corn Puddin', <laughs> which is just about the catchiest song I've ever heard. Um, I, f I figured the song was a euphemism, but then I found out the writers were Mormons. So I, I don't know if that's an, uh, an intentional yeah, uh, euphemism. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, if he wants my corn puddin', he's going to have to marry me. So if he wants my puddin', he'll have to marry me. I mean, oh, I, I feel like they're just going with all, everything that just seems on brand for what we're doing. You know, I, that's yeah. just the whole town busting into the song about how much they love corn pudding is like just perfect and ridiculous. We do have uses of like kind of that like kind of quirky um, rhyme scheme to kind of fit the characters and their location. Um, Cecily Strong says, if you have any extra. That's, uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a part where they say yeller and feller. Um, that's all stuff you'll hear in Oklahoma. Right Oklahoma. Hammerstein was big on that kind of phonetic writing stuff. Well, they tickle the brain. Those are really yeah. exciting rhymes. But also I think because with the boy girl back and forth, there were also some kind of uh, seven brides for seven brothers vibes um, and kind of some like Michael Kidd choreography vibes. Um, and of course, like an old, like because like an old 50s, 40s musical, they always end in some kind of like really anachronistic like jazz chord. That would be like really, hip for the 50s yeah. but not so much for for the era when it takes place so it's like corn pudding yeah, yeah. dissonant jazz corn yeah because they're they're playing to today's audience so yeah like... today but today's audience in the 40s and 50s like it's fantastic yeah. and then i think the other huge influence homage is uh, Finian's Rainbow, uh, with the appearance of Martin Short as a leprechaun. That was right on the nose. Brigadoon is uh, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, Schmigadoon seems to be in like a Music Man Americana world. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so Martin Short is a leprechaun. <laughs> There's also, um, you know, so Jeff, you know, Jeff, I, uh, you know, teach a, a musical theater summer program. Right. And it was founded by my mother. And the first summer we did it, we did a review of Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals. And she split each section into like the character tropes that you would find in a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. So like the leading mm. man, the leading lady, the cute couple, the supporting couple. Yeah, there's uh, something like that. The, the inspirational character, the uh, the Aunt Eller or the uh, Mother Superior, um, mm. and, or the kid characters. And I found, I kept thinking about that in the episode because um, there's a lot of, oh, and that villains, you know, there's a lot of those tropes in this. Yeah, so Alan Cumming plays the mayor, um, and then um, Anne Harada plays the mayor's wife, and then... Um, Kristen Chenoweth. Kristen Chenoweth plays kind of the... She's amazing. The priest's wife, who's yeah. just... I've never seen Kristen she's Chenoweth like so restrained. Devil. Yeah. Uh, she's great. And then... Um, she's bubbling under the surface, though. Yeah, and these are all just, like, really familiar tropes and characters yeah. you'll see in musicals like this. And their roles really become clear kind of as the as the episodes go on. Um, I think it's clear we're going to see Chenoweth kind of falling into... Kind of a Eulalie McKechnie Shin from the Music Man role, except way harsher, less fun. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. She's scary. She's really I wouldn't scary be surprised this. if we add a little, pick a little, talk a little, ladies like Gavin stuff. So yeah, so that's episode one. So uh, opinions on the episode? I, I just, I, as I said, I think it was the perfect start to this series. I think the tone is set immediately, and the the artistic design, the set design that. Everything about it, even uh, even right down to all like the specific choreo and how you mentioned how yeah everybody starts to like face out. They're all know, they're like, all cheating very, out and they all out. have those arms and they're all kind of playing to the balcony, which is good. Even though the cameras are in their faces, like everyone's walking a really fine line with that. And I did notice something in that first scene, Kristen Chenoweth. Um, is sort of looking camera right, like she's looking at the characters, but Fred Armisen is looking right at the camera. And I think that that had to have been intentional because it's this, it makes it sort of creepy, but you can't really put your finger on it. 
And I, I don't know if that was intentional, like bringing to me, it the just audience. looked like he was looking at him because that's where it made it. It he could was be that, be. but I it, to, it made it a, this weird kind of creepy, fun, different kind of world thing. I don't know. It brought me into the story in addition to all the rest of it, of course. I'm excited to see um, Cecily Strong doing a musical TV show because I've always felt she's like kind of the dark horse of SNL. So like, talented, so funny. Oh my God. But she always is really good when she does musical theater kind of homages on the show. Like I love Deborah's time. Let's do Deborah's time. Check. Books all are balanced. Christmas phone is cleared. <sighs> Relax, Deborah. I just love that. Um, and so watching her kind of be in a musical is really fun to me. And Keegan Michael Key, there's no way that guy didn't do musicals like his no whole childhood. He had to have. He had to have. <laughs> um, but he's not quite in the, she's kind of dipping into the singing. He, he hasn't quite got there yet. But oh, but I, he will. You he's going to he bust out. He can do it. <laughs> so, what did you think of Aaron Tveit? Do you want to tell us about him? Uh, so I did Rent with Aaron Tveit long ago. He joined our tour um, midway through. He came in as a Steve, the honest living squeegee guy. When was this? Uh, this was in 2003, 2004, right around there. He, uh, he dropped out of college to join our show. So I was on tour throughout the States with Rent, and w they would do uh, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights, AIDS benefit shows. Um, uh, drag shows and stuff for charity in a bunch of different cities. Aaron Tveit like just jumped in and was a backup dancer for them and he was just doing the coolest stuff. He was clearly, he clearly had something that was really special and I loved how he just didn't care. He was completely uninhibited. He's like, I want to be in these dances. And then of course he was great in the show and, he, and I, later on I saw him in a bunch of shows. And the rest is history, really. I mean, they you got, see him they, in Next to Normal. Yeah, I saw him in Next to Normal off Broadway, though, not the Broadway version. Because yeah, it still had Brian Dashty James in it. Extraordinary talent. I loved him in uh, Les Mis. I thought he, uh, he was a terrific Andrelas. I mean, he's done tons of stuff, but um, it's nice seeing him in this where he gets to be kind of tongue in cheek and. Funny. Yeah, he's kind. Of, I remember one of the, one of my friends uh, on, uh, who was on tour with us, Daryl Brown. He was a Benny. And he, he, I remember one time he was like, he's got that classic like movie star look. He told me, what, we were talking about it one time, and he's like, yeah, he's got that look. And I'm like, yeah, I think so. He's, he's like, he, he could really make it. It serves him in this because he's just so watchable. His face is so interesting. You know, he looks like yeah. a, he looks like a classic leading man. And then, of course, he knows how to do it because he's been doing musical theater all this time. I love the intro to his song because it's one of those great, like, old, you know, those old musicals. They always have, like, an intro that no one, Jeff, anytime I play an old musical theater song for Jeff, you it'll start and yeah. he'll be like, what is this song? And I'm like, wait for the verse. This is just the intro. Mm -hmm. And and he has some ridiculous intro where he's talking about how a squirrel will be with another <laughs> yeah. squirrel and yeah. a robin has an itch to scratch. It makes yeah, no sense, yeah. but it's totally the kind of thing, like, I'm like this animal that does a thing because yeah. I'm different. And then, you get, and then you get to the melody that everyone knows after that, you know, because yeah. Sinatra didn't lay down the first chorus, you know. There are some really just genuinely funny stuff in the first episode, oh like God. some some winky things, like um, Cecily Strong mentions how like it's co obviously colorblind casting, um, which is great because that happens a lot when you kind of do these older musicals nowadays. Um, well, it should happen all the time. Yeah, sure. in all these shows, they're just kind of like default white, and so yeah. they kind of you know they get yeah. to you do colorblind casting in order to mix things up also if you're like me you have a school that's you know very diverse and so you gotta you just put the good kids where they belong i really like the line men are men and cows are cows <laughs> i just i just thought that was really great where the men are men and the cows are cows and the farmers oh. wild as they push their cows uh, I think the second that the actors come talking to them, um, Keegan-Michael Key makes a, oh, I hate interacting with the performers yeah. joke, which is very relatable content. Very relatable And that content. was, yeah, it was really cool. They kind of continued that on because you have to figure out a way to, to keep it somewhat in the real world for for our audience. Their hotel you know? room cost a dollar. Yeah, so, it was so but, great. but then she's like, you know, you're just complaining that two rooms came for a dollar. Yeah. Like, okay, what, you know, like, these, that's just like clever writing to get them to keep going along with the story. Yeah. Because they, ha they have to do so. Yeah. Know? Yeah, so I think episode one was really a, like a strong start. It grabs you right away. Um, I think if you know Golden Age musicals, which almost all of us know at least one, even if you don't think you do, you probably do. Well, you know it when you see and it. And <laughs> the thing is, you know the tropes, so I think yeah. like you'll really enjoy it, but I think you enjoy it like even more if you know exactly what they're parodying. It's only 
yeah, I'm, I'm not doing this. So at the end of the first episode, the, uh, you know, Keegan-Michael Key, uh, what are their character names? Melissa and Josh. Melissa and Josh realize that they can't get out of Schmigadoon. They're stuck. They keep trying to cross the bridge and they can't oh, yeah, get yeah. out. And then yeah. Martin Short Leprechaun sings to them uh, that <laughs> they, in order to get out, they have to find their true love. So now they're like, wait a second, are we not each other's true love? Yeah, and, and then they get the into fight. a big fight called Lover's Spat. Um, and this song had a lot of really funny homages uh, in it, if you know what you were looking for. First of all, the characters just kind of cr creeping out of the bushes, kind of going like, Ooh. But then they get into this thing where you're like, you can't do a thing without another thing. You can't with the thing when there's dirt in the road. Okay, first of all, that is very, um, you can't put a fire when the fire's out. That's like, um, um, that part in South Pacific, and, and watch that man right out of my hair. You can't plow a field without hitting some stones. Every state's bound to have some fun. You can't light a fire with the woods all wet. No, you can't make a butterfly strong. So that is really Rodgers and Hammerstein. That is very, um, wash that man right out of my hair. Even a little, like, <laughs> many a new day. And then um, they get into the Lover's Spat song, which, I mean, it had a, a lot of different things to it. It had, like, the waltz break in the middle. It had kind of, again, the, like, kind of shapoopy vibes almost at some points. Um, and then some direct homages to Agnes DeMille's Dream Ballet in Oklahoma, specifically this move. Then she complains that he don't understand her. It blew my mind. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else oh my god! That? I just love that song. And I, again, I'm just speaking generally about what the song does. It's a perfect musical theater song when you have the the background people going. Then she said. Then yeah. he said. Yeah. Then she's. It's just like one of those amazing things that only ever happens in musical theater. It really only in classic musical theater. I feel like, but unless it's an homage. It's just so it's just clever to me. I like the way, and they were just kind of improvising, or it felt like even their, their fight, dialogue is even just their fight into the was song. kind of in the meter, which kind of was really good. Yeah, I mean, and 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 so, and we see it even later, like, oh, I guess I'm in this song now, and that's such a fun idea. Like, yeah, these two characters that aren't in a musical and end up in one. Okay, so then um, they break up, and uh, Cecily <laughs> yeah. Strong ends up, you know, going to the woods to cry, and she finds Alan coming there, and he's. <laughs> He sings, <laughs> I swear to God, I busted out laughing. He's so good. Um, he sings a song called Somewhere Love is Waiting for You. And um, God, Alan Cumming knows exactly what musical he's in. He, yeah, first of all, exactly. he's doing a full on American accent for the whole thing. And then when the song starts, his Scottish accent comes out. And he's singing with this, like, kind of really, like, he's really, like, laying his baritone on thick. And I think what he's doing, there's a few different references, I think. The song itself reminded me of two Rodgers and Hammerstein songs. It reminded me of um, Something Wonderful from The King and I, mm. uh, which is very much that inspirational, like, you have to understand this person song. Yeah. But also it reminded me of Some Enchanted Evening, yeah. uh, particularly the fact that he goes into some... Weird accent that his character didn't have before. If you know South Pacific, uh, the role was created by Ezio Pinza, who's Italian, playing a Frenchman. So, you know, anytime some enchanted evening is sung, it's always by some foreign guy with an accent. Somewhere love is waiting for you. Some enchanted evening. You met your stranger. Very funny. Um, yeah, it was a great, great little moment. There was even that little coda at the end um, where they have, where it ends and they have a little bit of dialogue and then Cecily Strong was like, oh, wait, uh, oh, we're going again? Um, oh, <laughs> yeah. she said, oh, it repeats and then he kind of finished it up, which is great. Like, you see that in all those old musicals. It also kind of reminded me of, do you, do you remember in Men in Tights where he goes, the night is young and you're yeah. so beautiful, be flat, oh, night, which yeah, itself yeah. was like kind of like a parody of like yeah. some enchanted evening, but yeah. that's kind of what it reminded Reminded me of. The night is young and you're so beautiful. B flat. The night ah. is young. Oh my god, they had their little picnic <laughs> basket auction, which again, direct, direct lifting from 
Oklahoma. There is a huge, important, really important second act scene that takes place at like a picnic auction like that. Um, hmm. And uh, everyone's, you know, betting two bits, four bits, six bits. And it, it's so hilarious. Um, and so it's really funny to see kind of the Marion the Librarian character, because Ariana DeBose is there kind of hosting it. She's there with the mayor and they're doing a scene from... Oklahoma. So it's very interesting. Uh, I will also point out that um, among the people bidding, there was a Curly and a Marcellus bidding uh, on picnic baskets. Even dropping names. Curly would be from Oklahoma and Marcellus would be from the music man. Yeah. Marcellus Washburn. Gotcha. Um, Not Marcellus Wallace. No. Uh, there's another, again, direct lifting from the music man when um, Kristen Chenoweth and her biddies are kind of <laughs> mad at the library and then Ariana DeBose makes a Balzac joke again. Directly from the music man. Chaucer Rebelais Balzac. Hilarious. Hmm. Oh, then when um, when uh, Tevate bids on her, uh, when he bids on drunk Cecily Strong, which, again, any excuse to get Cecily Strong playing drunk. She has to play drunk. So good, Everything good. Everything has to. Um, but but he, he bids, and then he goes, all I got in the world. <laughs> it's Curly's line Two from bits. Oklahoma yeah. when he's when he's bidding on uh, Lori. That was my favorite, my absolute favorite line of dialogue was when Keegan-Michael Key is like, why is there a unit, a, a name for 12 and a half cents? Yeah. Because I've always wondered that it's so stupid. Like, it was an old-timey thing, two bits is 25 cents for some it's reason. because money was so, you did bits, more with less money. Yeah, then. yeah, exactly. So when I, I went to University of Florida, and there used to be a, an old guy who would come out on the field and warm up the crowd, and everybody called him two bits. Because he'd go, two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar. Come on, Gators, get up and holler. And it was so dumb, but everybody loved it. But Keegan-Michael Key finally put forth my question, why, why? But anyway, we, I, it made me laugh for about 25 minutes. There's also a moment where um, Tevate says, ye hunk, which I think is an amalgamation of ye gods and great honk, which is what uh, Zanita and uh, Tommy Gilas say in The Music Man. Well, in the movie version of The Music Man. In the stage version, he says Geely Cly, but ye hunk. This girl knows her stuff. Yeah. So then there's like a two-part uh, kind of duet where Cecily Strong is singing with Tevate, and then um, <laughs> yeah. Doug Cameron is, yeah. is like seducing Keegan-Michael Key, and this is called Enjoy the Ride. It's and great, that, Sarah. to me, felt very much like kind of later... Um, golden age, like kind of, um, kind of the mid to late fifties golden age. Um, the song that I think it's most directly parodying is baby. It's cold outside, yeah. which is written by Frank Lesser who wrote guys and dolls. So another the golden most age. Happy fella. Yeah. Uh, another golden age guy, yeah. um, but also it kind of gave me Adler and Ross and Comden and green vibes. It got, you know, kind of that like kind of jazzy, sexy flirtatious thing that happens a lot in on the town and also happens in shows like damn Yankees and pajama game. So I, yeah. and their, their choreography was very, very like early 50s pre-director Fosse, like when he was a choreographer. Yeah. It just kind of had those, you know, it's steam heat vibes. It's a really to satisfying vibe. It really works for that scene. I yeah. mean, I just loved it. And you know, neither of them are like Ooh. dancers, yeah. but I think they do them well with the choreography. It's very cute and like very flirty. And again, it's really fun that Cecily Strong is like so drunk and she's like really thirsting after Tevate, which is hilarious. I know. So here's like, yeah, Tevate. She like, says li his pants are real high-waisted, you know, it's really good. And they are. Um, but then yeah, it they gets... they went a little bit higher than normal. You know? Yeah. And then they go into the tunnel of love and, you know, supposedly things get busy. Uh -huh. But then um, Keegan-Michael Key is with Dove Cameron on like um, <laughs> like a hilltop and it's implied very quickly that she's quite young. Yeah, and, they make... and then she yeah. kind of does like the sexier, like kind of reprise of Enjoy the Ride where she's like, she's like licking the pie. Yeah, She's saying, I won't do it till, till I'm, I'm a married. Bride. Yeah, till, till I'm, I'm a bride. bride. So she never sings yeah. the other lyric. And she has that great line where she says, like, a pair of pants, referring to a man. That's, like, a great old-timey lyric. You'll oh, hear great. that all the time. I love yeah. it. Um, and then at the very end, the, her dad comes out with the shotgun, which is um, very much Ada Wanny in uh, Oklahoma. <laughs> I think about it in all those old-timey TV shows, too. Beverly Hillbillies, shit oh, like yeah. that. You know, like... It's it's a, that's a, the old guy the old crazy guy with the rifle is an American trope. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. So uh, wow. more good stuff again. More so good. Uh, as soon as they hit me with the Agnes DeMille arms, I was like, I was like, woo wee! This is this is a lot. I'm Agnes just I'm stuff. really really happy for these musical theater actors because if this was like ten or fifteen years ago, I, I probably would have known a lot of these people. I don't know any of them, of course. But you mean in the ensemble? In the ensemble, but they're just living and and this is like what they were born to do because. They're all really, really talented. They're all ma majorly triple threats. And everyone they got um, is either like an established star with 
who started in musical. We haven't seen Jane Krakowski yet, right. but she's going to be there. But obviously, uh, Chenoweth. Um, is everyone is the first all of them are musical to. theater people. Uh, Alan Cumming, they're all musical yeah. theater people. They're people who've been on Broadway but have television credits as yeah. well yeah. Uh, and film credits. And then you have people like Aaron Tveit and Ariana DeBose, who's she's about to have a huge moment because she's going to be um, Anita in West Side Story. So she's mm. about to kind of make that big transcending leap from yeah, Broadway star postponed. to movie star just like uh, Aaron Tveit did. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, the creator of the show is a guy named Cinco Paul, and he was talking, I, I watched a video, and he was talking about how he had this idea for the show ages ago, um, and it was only kind of when the television landscape became as diverse as it is was he able to you know, really like make it a show, which yeah. is kind of one of the cool things about this era that we're living in is that even weird golden age musical pastiche TV shows can can get picked up and well, find an audience. Didn't you say you knew the choreographer? Uh, Chris Catelli. Uh, I don't. I I had you auditioned know who for he is. him. Oh, okay. I had met him a couple times. We have mutual friends. He's might be. He's a little older than me, but Chris Catelli started. He he would he was doing like he was one of those guys who's like doing a Broadway show and he's doing like a Fringe show and he's doing he just was always had his fingers and hands in something. Well, he but knows what he's doing. He he's, knows his references. He knows. There's so no much. way that he didn't sit down and meticulously plan out the whole thing, for yeah. sure. He's incredible. And Bernie Telsey, obviously the casting director who casts basically most things uh, on Broadway as pertains to musicals, if it's pop or rock especially. But you know that they were going to nail this casting. And and I just am so happy for these the kids in the ensemble, or the, the actors in the ensemble, because they're really getting a moment here. They're getting long shots, long scenes, the whole song. You know, They're getting a lot of pub here. I, 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 there was one more thing I wanted to say about the show within a show or about a show because I feel like the best show I ever saw do that was Urinetown and they literally were doing things like moving the, the ladder so the guy could get up and do the trope thing and, I've, and the, the way that's the a hardest A show about thing. a show? A show about the tropes of musicals and that after Urinetown was so successful there were about a thousand knockoffs that I went to go see because my friends were doing readings and they were all bad because if if you make the audience not care about it because you're joking around the whole time, then you lose them. So there's a super fine line about being the art form while also lampooning the art form. So you have to also be a sweet and compelling story for the you audience. You have to, to love on. what you're parodying. Like, honestly, these two first two episodes were perfect for me. I had no idea what to expect, but... I felt like they they had a perfect start here. I'm excited to see where it goes. You know, this is way more kind of my my vibe than something like you know the prom or Mamma Mia. So uh, oh, I, totally. I'm I'm very excited uh, to see where this goes, and I'm excited to pick up on you know all the crazy golden age musical moments. So again, if there's anything we missed from episodes one and two, uh, just let us know in the comments. Um, we could bring them up next time. Uh, I'm sure there's something that I missed. Uh, there's, it was, I mean, so densely packed. Okay, so uh, we hope you liked this episode. Check back uh, if you need more help on your Schmigadoon references. And uh, you know what? I feel like corn pudding. Do you want pudding too? I'm gonna paint your wagon. Gonna paint it good. <laughs> gonna paint our wagon. Gonna paint it good. We ain't bragging. We're gonna coat that wood.